Good evening, and welcome to our Bible study. I'm Pastor A.D., Pastor of True Vine, NBC, here in Houston, Texas, and I thank you so much for joining us for our Bible study. And today, we're still in the book of Titus. We're in Titus chapter 3, Titus chapter 3, starting at verse 1, and we're going to do verses 1 and 2 today. And today's topic is the Christian's responsibility in a worldly and evil society. The Christian's responsibility in a worldly and evil society. And so, of course, I have an overview about give you a good background of what's happening in this particular um, chapter and verses. And after that, I will we'll jump right into it. But let's pray first before we get started. Thank you so much for all your support. Continue to support this channel. We love you. We love you. We love you. Lord, we thank you so much for everything. Lord, continue to keep us, continue to bless us, continue to watch over us, Lord. We need you, Lord, on every hand. And Lord, today, to God, in today's study, to God, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be more like you, Lord. Help us to be conquerors. Help us, to God. Help us to be, um, to, to persevere, Lord, to keep going for you, Lord, and run this race, to God, and not run it in vain. We love you so much, Lord, and we bless your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, the Christian's responsibility in a worldly and evil society. So, here, here's the overview. Paul gives us this overview, this background. So, I believe we come into one of the most challenging and relevant sections of this brief epistle as we approach this last chapter. I want to begin this evening to address the first eight verses. And I want to look at those verses under the title, The Christian's Responsibility in a Worldly and Evil evil society. Some have said in years past that we are living in a post-Christian America. Perhaps it could be better said we are living in a sub-Christian America. We want to say we're Christians. We just want, we don't want to commit to what Christianity is, right? We want to claim it, but we don't want to live it. And our Christianity has become hollow. We are clearly pagan, but we wear the mask of religion. Our nation is now affirming through its leaders, through its Congress, its legislative bodies, its courts, its judges, a distinctively anti-Christian agenda, right? Anything and everything that is distinctively Christian is being swept away under the um, rugs of equal rights, moral freedom is everything now. Uh, and as believers, frankly, we tend to resent this. The Christianity, that once was part of the fabric of our nation that created some cultural props to hold us up and to give us a biblical morality and some divine standard in which to judge behavior is now gone. All that is gone, is abrogated, is gone. It's no more. So cultural Christianity, whatever it is, it was, is dead, is dead. Biblical mor morality is assaulted constantly. Mor moral freedom reigns as God. Um, materialism, family breakup and breakdown is epidemic. Abortions go on. Sexual evils, drugs, crime, pagan education is flooding our nation like the Mississippi River. And we can't come close to copying or dealing with this flood of evil. We have torn down all the standards and now we can't figure out what is right. So we don't know what to teach anybody. So we can't control behavior in, in the early years of childhood. And we now have a generation of people who have taken the agenda and are running with it. We don't have enough standards to control them. We don't have enough police to arrest them. We don't have courts to process them. And we don't have enough jails to keep them in. We don't like what the president is doing. We don't like his agenda. We don't like his decisions. We don't like, we don't like the kinds of things that our senators or our congressmen are doing. We are repulsed by the verdicts that are being rendered in the courts and that exonerating people of criminal intent and act and letting off people who have no intended ill. I should say, who are judging people who, who had no intended ill and letting off people who are guilty of things we are we think that are what heinous, right? We aren't happy with the agenda all the way down, whether it's, it's judici, judicial um, branch or legislative or executive branch. I mean, on and on, we are tired of the evolution of freedom to point out where anybody can be can do absolutely anything. We are angry that perversion is legalized in our country and the will of God is blatantly uh, rejected. It, it's one thing to have sin. It's something else to 
redefine it as acceptable human behavior. And I really believe that these are times that can that can breed not only sadness in our lives of Christians, but even hostility, right? And I, I sense that is the conversation and meetings I have in various places with people and on and on, sad trends, and now we're a bit angry about it. And then we get even angrier when they decide to raise our taxes so we can fund more of this agenda that's going on, ungodly agenda. And we fear our our ourselves and and our lives, and mostly we fear for our children and we fear for our grandchildren, don't we? And the most uh, we know is yet to come and is going to come on our children's children. And the question that I want to pose to you this evening is this, how are, how are we to respond now that our society is so pagan, so worldly, so even, how evil, how are we to react? Okay, how are we to react as believers in Christ? What What is the proper Christian response in a pagan culture, an uh, evil cult, culture? You know, what is the response for a Christian? Paul answers the very question in Titus 3, 1 through 8, that is precisely the issue here. And that's what we'll be dealing with for this week and next week. Um, Titus 1 through 8. Titus, as you know, is on the island of Crete. He is there to set in order the things that remain in the churches, and there were at least a hundred cities on this island. And we don't know how many of them had churches, but many did. He has a very great responsibility to set the church in order to ordain godly leaders against a very corrupt culture. Cretans, you'll remember, according to chapter 1, verse 12, were basically designated by a prophet of their own as liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons, right? Um, unquestionably, they were engulfed in idolatry, idolatry, I'm sorry, in all of the uh, extent uh, paganism that made up the Greek and Roman world of the time. Titus then had these churches as little pockets of righteousness in a sore of paganism and needed to instruct them about how to react to the culture around them. Very important. It's very important. Now, just as a footnote, before we read the text, I hear a lot of um, talk today about the church impacting culture, uh, coming back uh, here and there. You can hear it on and on TV, various um, social media pages, and, um, and then on and on. But frankly, folks, that's not our the goal is not our is not just um, confronting our culture, affecting our culture, and impacting our culture. That's not just the goal. But frankly, uh, the, um, it sounds like a noble goal, and, I, and I'm sure there are people who can see certain noble aspects of it, and, and and there may be some. But our goal is not to impact our culture by changing their moral values, right? Our goal is not to impact our culture by creating traditional values, family values through legislation of judicial um, process. Our goal is not to make sure that the United States of America adheres to a national policy that equates to biblical morality. No, that is not our goal. We are not to involve uh, in upgrading cultural conduct. We are interested in people becoming saved. That is our agenda. That's our only agenda, right? Is saving souls. If we're going to change our culture, we're going to change it from the inside out, right? From the inside out. Get it? Because that's what happens when you become when you become a believer. You get changed from the inside out. And you see, the church has one mission. We are a nation of priests, right? And a priest had one simple function, to bring people to God, to usher them into the pre in his presence. It is the only thing we are to, we are in the world to do, right? Frankly, if people die in a, in a communist um, government or a democracy, it really doesn't matter if they end up in hell or not, right? If they die under a tyrant or a benevolent dictator, it doesn't matter if they end up in hell. If they die believing that homosexuality is wrong or believing that homosexuality is right and end up in hell, it doesn't matter. If they die as a policeman or a prostitute without Christ, they're going to end up in the same place. It doesn't matter whether they die moral or immoral will make no difference in their eternity. Whether they stood on the side of the street with uh, the pro abortion rights group and scream for legalizing and maintaining legal um, abortions or on the other side of the street against abortion and scream to the top to stop the killing on and on, etc., etc. Et 
So it doesn't matter, right? That isn't the issue. The issue is salvation. The issue is salvation. The sad reality is that when the church gets a moralizing, politi politicizing bent, it, 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 it usually has a negative impact on its evangelization uh, mission because then it makes the people hostile to the current system. They become the enemies of society rather than the compassionate friends. If we are going to see our nation transformed, it has to be down from inside out, from the inside out. That's our agenda, right? A change, a transition. And, and so we're here to preach Christ and to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. And that's it. That's what we're here to do, church. Preach Christ and, and that's it. To know, that's all we need to know is Christ and him crucified. That's it. So this is the trustworthy statement and concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who believe God may be carefully to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. I want to start with the last line. These things are good and profitable for men. What are you talking about, Paul? What are you saying? What, what I'm saying is if you live this way, it's going to benefit everyone around you. It's very important how you can conduct yourself. In what sense is it? good and profitable for men. Go back to chapter two. In chapter two, he was talking about Christian conduct. And he says in verse five, that we are to so live that the word of God may not be dishonored. Remember that um, last week and a week before we talked about that, that our opponent may be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. The end of verse 10, that we may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in every in every respect, right? So where's the what's the point? What's the point? We want to so live as the to exalt the word of God, shut the mouths of the critics and put on display God's saving power. How do we do that? We want the world to know that God is a saving power, that God transformed people. So how do, how do we do that? By living it, by living it. You know, we can talk it all day, but we got to walk it. We got to walk this thing. And how can we convince them that by showing them our transformed lives, right? So we are to be displaying God's saving power every single day, displaying God's saving power. Now, remember that chapter three follows the wonderful discussion in chapter two, verses one through 14. And in the section of one through 14 of chapter two, Paul was also telling Titus that he needed to instruct the church about their behavior. But in, chap in that chapter, it was the behavior among Christians and how we conduct ourselves together as Christians is going to give a testimony to the world of God's saving, transforming power when we live holy, gracious, loving, wise, kind lives. All of those things, all of, all of the things that he said in chapter two. And it is very evident, very evident that we are not like everybody else to the world watching, okay? Because they are watching. That is going to make the world, the word of God honor. We want to make the word of God, want to put the word of God on a pedestal, put it like that. So we want the word of God to be honored by, our, by the way we live, by the way we live and have our being every single day. So that is going to silence the critics and that is going to adorn the doctrine of God as saving God. One who can totally transform people, right? Because he has transformed your life like he transformed my life. So the way we live within the church and among ourselves is crucial as a platform for our pro proclamation. Then in chapter three, concern not with how we live among each other in the church, but how we live in a society, how we live among non-Christians, how we live in our culture. So if we are going to make God's saving power manifest, we have to make it manifest in our own relations, right? <laughs> with Christians and with non-Christians. So with everybody. And never is the time more crucial for or for careful Christian behavior than when believers are engulfed in pagan culture. I mean, that's how it is. You understand, don't you? In Paul's day, there was no cultural Christianity. There was no Christian Christianity until he introduced it. Paul introduced it to them. In the Gentile world, it was just blatant, comprehensive paganism with all of the trappings that Satan could develop into it. It was totally and exclusively, with the exception of a few Jews, a satanic system. All the existing religion, uh, all the uh, existing ideologies, philosophy, thought, existing law, order, 
everything, etc. Existing values, morals uh, were derived from a non-Christian system, which was pagan. It was thoroughly pagan until Paul arrived and he started the churches. He introduced Christ. And the clash was so great that it cost him and many others their lives. Remember, Paul said to the Jews first and then to us, the Gentiles. And that's what he did. He introduced the word to us. He introduced Jesus to us. So Paul knew what it was like to live in a thoroughly pagan culture, far more pagan than what we experience because in our country, there's a great force of truly regenerated people. And that means repentant, saved people. And he knew what it was to be in a world of abusive, deadly, and equality and slavery. He knew what it was to be in a culture of tyrants and petty dictators who were murderous. And he knew what it was to be under abusive leadership. He knew what it was to see a society engulfed up to its ears and sexual perversion, the breakdown of the family. We read in some ancient documents about people who had 26 and 27 wives and or husbands, um, depending on the situation. The world was literally flooded with idols and petty gods, lowercase g. People were heavily taxed and the tax collectors were extortionists who took what wasn't justly due to them. If anybody complained, they would take their life as soon as Look, as soon as you look at them. And the world was full of terrorists, people who were going around executing those who had done something against them. Even in the Jewish world, there were the, the zealots, the, the um, Sicaria, um, the guys who carried the daggers and came up behind the authorities in Israel and stabbed them to death. Terrorism was everywhere. It was an ugly world, very ugly world. And Paul never ever says in any of his letters, now, ladies and gentlemen, we need to moralize our pagan culture. He never says that. We need to impact our culture somehow. He never says that. No, all he ever said was we need to evangelize it. We need to evangelize the word of God. We need to spread the word of God. And he wasn't calling for anybody, any kind of protest and nothing like that, any type of signs or taking action in that particular way. He wasn't calling for any kind of contention or any kind of war against the existing uh, mentality. He was calling for the preaching of the gospel that transformed the lives of others. But it wasn't just the preaching. It, it was the living within the church and outside the church that gave a platform that made the message believable. You see, what God had done for the Christians in Crete, he wanted to do for a lot of other folks too. But the conduct of the believers there was crucial to that saving work, that saving enterprise. So he tells Titus to instruct the people with authority. Remember that in chapter two, verse 15, with authority regarding their duty in a pagan world. Okay, so that concludes our long intro. So that brings us to <laughs> verse one of chapter three. And it reads, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey to be ready for every good work. So let's stop at this verse. Let's look and focus on this first verse. He says, just for two words, remind me, remind them, tell them. And I want to point out to you that he's simply saying this isn't anything new. Obviously, he had covered this in the past. Certainly, the folks knew the responsibilities that they had for living in a pagan culture, but they needed to be reminded. Sometimes we all need to be reminded of something, right? And that is a duty that belongs to everyone who stands behind the sacred desk, as it were, and proclaims the true gospel to God's flock. We are basically here to remind you of what you know. Present um, imperative means it's a regular, ongoing, continued duty of reminding them. And he wants to remind them of the necessity for behaving themselves in a pagan society. Now, what does... Uh, in these eight verses, it sums up by asking them to remember four realities, four great realities. It is wonderfully organized around these realities. First, number one, remember your duty. Remember your duty. What is your duty as a believer in Christ? Remember your duty. Second, remember your former condition. Remember your former condition. Do you remember? Where do you come from? What you used to do? How, what was your job when you worked for the enemy, for the devil? What was your job before you were saved? And thirdly, remember your salvation. Remember your salvation. Do you remember that when you were saved, when you first came to Christ? And fourthly, remember your mission. What is your mission now and forevermore until you leave this world? What is your mission? 
to spread the gospel. And if you will remind the people of, of those four things, it'll keep their behavior, as Peter put it, excellent among the pagans, excellent among the unbelievers, excellent among the worldly people. Remember your duty. And he outlines them in verses one and two. Remember your former condition. And he outlines that in verse three and four, actually verse three. Then he says, remember your salvation, verses four through seven. And finally, in verse eight, he reminds them, remember your mission. And if you keep those things in mind, they become the motivation for living excellently in a pagan world. I wish I could give you them, give them all, I'm sorry, to you this evening, but I can't. Uh, I'll be, we have a long Bible study if I do that. And it's already long. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I could, but I won't. I won't do that. So you have to come back next week and we'll get deeper into it. Okay. We'll try to get to the eighth verse next week. And um, for the last, but it, it's, it's, but let's take point one. Remember your duty. Remember your duty. Do you remember your duty? What is your duty? We may be hurt. Okay. We may be disappointed. We may be angry as we watch um, Christian influence die. We may be angry at what we see happening in the courts and congresses and, and executives, like I talked about earlier, the offices of our land. What is our response? We may not agree with the decisions that they are making, here's what it says, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be un uncontentious, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Seven virtues are listed there, seven virtues. Now listen to this. It doesn't matter whether your ruler is Caesar, Herod, Pilate, Felix, Festus, Agrippa, Stalin, Hitler, Weston, Churchill, Bill Clinton. It doesn't matter who it is. He says, be subject, right? You teach them to be subject. So it can be Trump. It can be Biden. It can be Obama. It doesn't matter. He says, be subject. Rulers were tyrants. They, they lacked integrity. They were murderous. They were not noble. Governments made laws and maybe all the laws were equitable. Um, equatable, I'm sorry, just and fair. But he says, you be subject to the rules authorities. He is reiterating a very, very commonly given biblical principle. Matthew 22, the Pharisees were always trying to trap Jesus, right? They want to trap him publicly because they wanted to discredit him publicly and turn some element of population against him. So they sent disciples to him along with Herodian, Herodians and <clears throat> They said in verse 16, teacher, we know that you're true, truthful and you teach the way of God and truth and defer to no one and you're not partial to any. And that was the whole lot of sinful flattery. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? Now, what they're trying to do is to get him to say it, it isn't, it is or it isn't, either or. If he says it is lawful, all the Jews are going to hate him and, and because they hate Caesar and, and they hate the poll tax. They hate the whole idea of being in an occupied country ruled by a bunch of pagans. And if, on the other hand, they he agrees with the Jews and, and says, no, it's not right. It's not lawful before God to pay tax and Caesar. Don't pay your tax. Then they're going to tell the, they're going to tell the Romans. They're going to get him in trouble, more trouble. So one way or the other, they're going to get some element of power of populace against him. But Jesus perceived their evil intent and he said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. Now, now, see, a lot of you think that scripture in Matthew 7 is talking about, I preached on that too, so you can go back on that video and check that video out about uh, in Matthew 7 about judging. Now, Jesus just judged again. Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? See that? Show me the coin used to poll tax. They brought him a, a denarius, a denarii, okay, a denarii or a denarius. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. So they brought him a coin. Caesar's, Caesar was on there. And, and you know what? They hated to use their coin, those coins, because anything with an image on it, it constituted what? Idolism. And they hated that. And of course, Caesar was a god, lowercase g. And this was idolatry 
to them. And they hated not only the idea of taxation, but they hated the idea of an errant idolatry and it a graven image made after a lowercase g God. It was a violation of the first commandment, but Jesus was so wise, he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God, the things are to God. And he upheld both. And he said on, 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 on the one hand, pay your taxes. On the other hand, this has nothing to do with God, nothing at all. You must give to God what is God's. The point for us today is Jesus paid his tax, even with the inherent idolatry. Okay, he said, pay your tax. What were they doing with the tax? These things that surely Jesus was not pleased with, right? Remember, he started turning over tables in the church. He became angry. He says, okay, to be angry, but sin not. But the general overall thrust of government was positive. And the Christians are to submit to it. Go to Romans 13. And here you have the most comprehensive statement about this from the Apostle Paul. The first few verses of chapter 13. Verse 1. Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities. That's just the plain and simple blanket statement. Everybody in his subjection. It doesn't matter whether it's democracy or communist form of government. It doesn't matter whether it's a monarchy or whether it's the dictatorship, you're in subjection, good, bad, no matter what, democracy, it doesn't matter, you're in subjection to the governing authorities. Then he gives you seven reasons why. Reason number one, government is designed by God. The government is designed by God. There is no authority except from God and those which exist are established by God. Who runs the government? Who runs our government and every government? The angels. God has designed human government. He has designed it to exist in a number of forms, and it is there because of its design for the control of human life. So submit. God designed it. Secondly, number two, reason number two, resisting is resisting God. Verse two, it says, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. Reason number three, resistors will be punished. In verse two, it says, those who oppose will receive condemnation upon themselves. So you submit to the government. Why? It's designed by God. Resisting is resisting God and resistors will be punished. Reason number four, government is designed to restrain evil. First three, rulers are not a cause for fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority or of authority? Do you... Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. In other words, government is designed to restrain evil. Fifthly, it's designed to promote good. Verse four, it is a minister of God to you for good. If you do what is evil, be afraid. And reason number six, government is empowered to punish. Government is empowered to punish. It, it is a minister of God and avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. And that's why it doesn't bear the sword for nothing. God has given it the right of capital punishment. That's what bearing the sword means. God has even the given government the right to take a life. Now, that takes us back to Titus again. The apostle is saying you need to be subject to the rulers and authorities and evangelistic reasons. Um, back down to the bottom of verse 8, this is good and profitable for the watching world. This is good and profitable for the watching world. That's in verse eight. And again, we'll try to see that next time. If not, we'll get there. Then he says, you need to be obedient. Verse one, to be obedient. The second one, you are to obey whatever it is they say. You say, are we ever to disobey? Yes. There's one occasion when we disobey. That is when they ask us to do what the Bible forbids us to do, or when they ask us not to do what the Bible commands us to do. And I talked about this Sunday I don't, you all didn't catch it, but I, I kind of went over this about obeying the, the law of the lands and when you don't have to obey the law of the lands. And the best illustration of that, as you know, is in Acts chapter four. They told us, they told the apostles not to preach. You remember they summoned them in Acts 4, 18, commanded them not to speak or teach. Peter and John said then, to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be judged. You judge whether we obey you or God, for we cannot stop speaking, they said. Chapter 5, they flogged them, um, <clears throat> whipped them. Verse 40, ordered them to speak no more. They went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing 
they had been considered worthy to suffer. Verse 42, every day in the temple, from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. Jesus is Christ. And see, today, a lot of us would have quit on Christ. We would have uh, been complaining about how that went, about getting beaten, uh, chastised, um, on and on. Uh, we would have just said no more, walked away, never preaching again, never saying anything again, uh, on and on. There's, that's just how we are. Some of us are today. And there comes a point in time when the state turns against the church and tells the church not to do what God has mandated it to do. Like in um, Canada, you if a preacher cannot preach against homosexuality there or he will be put in jail. He or she will be put in jail. So then we have to obey God and suffer the consequences. But be it prison or death. So either or, if you go against the government, you know this and I know this. You're going to get locked up, right? But you're standing for what is right, what is righteous. The Bible, what the Bible says. Not your opinion, but what the Bible says. So suffer the consequences, be it prison and or death. Either or. The only time we disobey is when we have been mandated by Scripture to do something we're forbidden to do or not to do something we are compelled to do. We are obedient. Then it says, at the end of verse one, remind them to be ready for every good deed. This is so good. Remind them to be ready for every good deed. This is aggressive goodness. This isn't reluctant saying, well, I'm not going to make an issue, right? I, I'm, I'm going to duty fully um, grit my teeth and pay my taxes. I'm going to keep my anger under control. No, this is, this is, this is an internal eagerness. The word ready means eager, eagerness to do every conceivable good deed. Approach life no matter how uh, volatile the culture is against Christianity, no matter how pagan it is to the very core, how engulfed in, a, in idolatry and sin it is. Um, we aggressively pursue every good thing as Galatians 6 and 10 says. We are doing good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. So by the way, by the way, this is in direct contrast with the behavior of false teachers. Look back at chapter one, verse 16 of Titus. Remember the description of false teachers. They are detestable, disobedient, worthless for any good deed. You can go back a month or so and look at that within the videos of True Vine, the Church of Love. So one of the things, beloved, that sets believers apart from false teachers in their Followers is the eager goodness in their lives of believers that demonstrates the transformation, that demonstrates new birth, salvation, the life of God, the power of the spirit, righteousness, virtue. And so we're to be known in society for our goodness, for our aggressive goodness, right? Not the, not mean, not meanness, but goodness. Verse two, let's look at it. Verse two. So speak evil of no one to be peaceable gentle, showing all humility to all men. So let's look at this. We're going to stop right here today. It's our last verse for the day. I know some of you are cheering. <laughs> so to malign no one, to malign no one, verse two, to malign no one, not even one person is the idea. It's the verb blasphemio in Greek, blasphemio in Greek, from which we get the word blaspheme. It means to slander or to treat with contempt. We must confront sin. We can confront Sin. We can confront sin. We can, we must, we will, it will behoove us to confront sin. That's what we're supposed to do. We must confront sin. We can confront sin. We can confront the sinner because of his sin. Yes, we can. That's what we're supposed to do, right? We're supposed to judge. We judge righteously when we judge, okay? And we judge with the word of God. That's what it means to judge righteously the right way. And so we must do that. We must call sinners to repentance, but we do not stoop to blasphemy, slander, cursing, and speaking contemptuously of people, right? I don't appreciate that when Christian people do that with regard to leaders, that's not the Christian approach. We may not like what they do, but we must remember, folks, the condition that they are in. Do we... Do we forget that they are blinded in their minds by the God, lowercase g, of the world, the devil? How else do you expect 
unconverted people to act then like unconverted people. And how do you unconverted people act? How do they act? How do unconverted people act? They act under the influence of Satan and his current system, and they're just carrying out the only agenda they can comprehend. Maligning them is unacceptable. Look at uh, 1 Timothy for a moment, chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Here was Timothy in, Eph in Ephesus, another corrupt, idolatrous city. He says to Timothy, I want to urge you that the entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all goodness and dignity. Listen to that. We're to be tranquil, right? That's a peaceful, quiet, godly, dignified. And what is our attitude toward the president and the Congress and the judges and the kings and everybody in authority? We pray for them. This is what God wants us to do, to pray for them constantly, making petition, prayers, and treaties for all those in authority that will that God will work in their lives, that God will save them. Because God, it says in verse three and four, is a saving God who has sent, verses five and six, Jesus Christ to provide salvation. God wants to save and he wants to pray for their salvation. Don't malign them. Pray for their salvation. Then he says in Titus, another interesting thing, that Christians are to be uncontentious. That's amicos, amicos in Greek, not fighting, amicos. So we're not to fight. We're to be peaceful, friendly, don't quarrel with the government, don't fight leaders. We're not to be combative, even though we don't like a lot of the things. It's okay to talk about it here and there with one another, but not don't get don't go crazy, don't be combative, don't, you know, want to fight over it and all that. No, no, no. Don't cuss them out and die and all that. Don't cuss them and and, and call them out. Don't do that. That's not the agenda for us. But we can disagree. Of course, we're not even of this world. Uh, this isn't even our country in a sense, okay? We're just pilgrims, remember? Keep in mind, we're just pilgrims. We're just here for, we're just visiting. We're here for a little while. So this isn't our country in a sense. We're just kind of sliding through. Um, some easy to contentious, contentious and hostile and angry about what happens in pagan culture in which we live, and especially if it elevates our taxes or if it changes our neighborhood, our culture, or whatever it is, we get angry about that. We don't like to see God deny his proper place and Satan exalted to be the leader of everything, but we are not to be contentious. Oh, we are not to fight. We are not to fight. This is a, a passing world for us. And all we can do is reach out as we move through and by the grace of God, touch some life with the saving gospel, both by what we say and what we are. Then he says, we're to be gentle. We're to be gentle, gentle. It's a beautiful word, epicus, epicus means to be reasonable and forbearing. So epicus in Greek. I think the simplest sim, uh, synonym is kind, considerate of human weakness, very patient with sinners. One writer says, sweet responsi responsibleness, um, not cantankerous, not argumentative, not angry, not hostile, sweetly re reasonable, gracious, kind, gentle. And then he closes in verse two with the last of the seven, showing every consideration, showing every consideration. That's the word meekness and beautitudes. <clears throat> meekness and the beauty too. So, and the beatitudes, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and the beatitudes, meekness. <clears throat> Matthew 5 and 5. I know some of you are like, what? What do you mean, beauty too? Beatitude. Matthew 5 and 5. And that's preatus. Preatus in Greek. Meekness. Preatus. Uh, we're meek. That's the power under control. You remember? Never exerting one's rights is what it means. So, never fighting for one's rights. Christians don't do that, right? We're not in a fight for our rights. We don't have an, an political agenda. We don't have any legislative agenda, though we feel like we should. We're not after any rights, though we feel like we should be. We don't want any particular rights with this society. We're, 
will just live for Christ come what may. It refers to patient trust in God. We commit our lives to him. Second Timothy 2 says, if we live like this meekly, gently, God may use us to lead people to repentance and the knowledge of the truth. Second Timothy 2 25. You see, everything we do has an evangelistic goal. And as we live in this world subjected to the authorities, the rulers, obedient to all the things that they, they lay out, out that uh, don't directly violate scripture, as we are eagerly pursuing every imaginable good deed within our society, as we malign no one, fight with no one, but rather are patient with sinners, gently, gentle, kind, we're going to demonstrate salvation because only transformed people can act like that. And then he closes in verse two by saying, for all men, all men, all men, you need to do this before everybody. The little phrase is very important. It appears a number of times in 1 Timothy, and I want to point them out to you and we'll close. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Why does he say for all men? Why, did, why does he throw that in there? Because all men has become an important term in Paul's mind. 1 Timothy 2, 1. Prayers, he says at the end of verse 1, should be made on behalf of all men. Why? Verse 4, because God desires all men to be what? Saved. To be saved. Very verse, verse 6 says, Christ <clears throat> Jesus, who gave himself as ransom for all, God desires all men to be saved. And then he says to believers, live your lives this way for all men to see. That's the consonant, um, the consonant, I'm sorry, the consonant with God's saving purpose. <clears throat> 1 Timothy 4 and 10 says, God is the savior of all men. All men need to see our testimony. They need to see the transformation. Titus 2 and 11, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. See, he repeats that phrase again and again and again and again, on and on, repetitive. And so God loves all men. God desires that all men be saved. He says, God wants you to pray for all men. The grace of God has appeared to all men. You live your life before all men so that they can see the transformation. Only Christians can live like that. That's our duty. That's how we have to live as believers in Christ. So God bless you. And I thank you so much for joining us for our Bible study. Um, I pray that you receive a lot out of it. I pray that you have learned a lot in how to live as a believer in Christ, how to move and have your being as a believer in Christ and how you should discern others. And that's just, that's a part of judging, discerning. And so I pray that you learn that and in helping others to um, see their way. And, and don't forget where you come from also. Always remember where you come from. Always remember what God has brought you from and what you used to do and how God has changed you. Because the Bible says, and so were some of you, but you were washed. You were washed by the blood of the Lamb. And so we must remember that, that we were washed, that we once were something, but we were washed. We was transformed. Uh, we, we received salvation. We received justification and we received sanctification. And one day we're going to receive glorification. But thank you so much for joining us. Tune in Friday. Tune in Friday for the pastoral moment where we can encourage and enlighten you with the word of God. And please share this video, share this Bible study so others can learn also as we go verse by verse here at True Vine. We thank you so much once again. We love you so much because you want to know why? Because we're True Vine and we are the church of love. God bless. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to this channel and join our online Christian family. Tithes, offerings, and donations can be made via Cash App at dollar sign TVMBC or by mail at Truvine Missionary Baptist Church, 1407 Grove Street, Houston, Texas, 77020. Thank you so much and have a blessed day.